Good evening, everyone. My name is Greg Greenway. I am not Matt Wittroba. For those of you who know Matt, I am sorry, um, but I am his replacement this evening, and I hope that I will do a good job because I know he does a great job. So my job is to wake you up and welcome you. So welcome, everyone. People will be coming in for the next 15 minutes. So uh, I will continually welcome everyone. So don't be uh, alarmed by repeated welcomes. Hold on. Hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. I want you to sing it with me. Hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Paul and Silas were bound in jail, they had no money for to go their bail. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Well, Paul and Silas began to shout, the jail doors opened and they walked out. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on. I got my hands on the gospel plow, I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Here we go. Hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. The only thing that we did wrong, stay in that wilderness today too long. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. The only thing that we did right was on the day we started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. The only chains that we can stand is the chain of holding hand to hand. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Thank you, I can feel it, I can feel you singing with me out there, getting yourself ready. Mm, all right. I think this is one you will know. These are sort of from the 60s movement. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved for like a tree. Planted by the water, we shall not be moved. You got it? Now we're going to speed this up, but I want to sing it slow so you got it. We shall not, we shall not be moved. 
we shall not, we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We, we shall not be moved. Showing up for voting rights, we shall not be moved. Showing up for voting rights, we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Now, if you feel silly sitting in your room by yourself, clapping, snapping your fingers, singing, maybe somebody walks in from the other room, don't worry about it. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Harmony's great. Oh, singing everybody, we shall not be moved. Singing everybody, we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Oh, standing up for justice, we shall not be moved. Standing up for justice, we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. Oh, now we ain't going nowhere. We shall not be moved. We ain't going nowhere. We shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall. We shall not. We shall not be moved. We shall not we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water we shall not be moved for like a tree planted by the water we shall not be moved. <laughs> I just saw a note from Gordon Gibson, and he and I are singing buddies um, for one of the most amazing moments in my life, I know. In 2015, we were at the Marching in the Ark of Justice the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Selma Voting Rights Action. And we were on a stage in St. Jude's, a little town inside of Montgomery. And we're all standing on the stage, and Reggie Harris, brilliant man that he is, he saved for that whole weekend. He saved, um, and this song just went right out of my head. He saved a great song, and he will tell me on the chat what exactly it was. Um, and I remember we all stepped forward, his brother's son, uh, Deborah Callan from the Union, and Gordon was there, and he didn't step forward with us to sing this song. And uh, I looked at him and said, Gordon, you got to sing with us. And he goes, I'm not a singer. And, and I said, you are now. <laughs> and so he stepped forward with us, and uh, it was We Shall Overcome. And that was 500 people standing in that gymnasium where the people had slept uh, before a concert that night before going into Montgomery the next day on the march. And it was a brilliant, brilliant moment. Uh, Reggie, thank you so much for that. But it was one of those moments where I felt like I could not sing a wrong note. I, I was just possessed by the moment, and I, it was all passing through me. I had little to do with it. So, um, so Gordon, we'll get a solo for you sometime, man. Ooh, this is an old spiritual. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more love 
somewhere. That's how it works. And there are three words to plug in. Next is hope. There is more somewhere. There is more somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. There is more peace somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more peace somewhere. Joy. There is more joy somewhere. There is more joy somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more joy somewhere. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm going to keep on till I find it. There is more. this mm. when I learned as a child there's two ways to see the world as it is and the way it could be now some people say that's just not my problem some people do what must be done now they see the hole in the fabric that must be sewn they see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done some people do 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 what must be done well they do what must be done they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done let's sing it together some people do 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 what must be done well they do what must be done they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done now i've seen the toll taken the tears that were shed i've seen the journey started and the ripples spread still people say well that's just not my problem some people do what must be done now they see the hole in the fabric that must be sewn they see the way blockaded and they roll back the stone they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done here we go some people do 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 what must be done well they do what must be done they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done oh they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must be done oh they see the day beyond the horizon and they do what must 
Bidan. Oh, it's been a joy singing for you. I can't wait to hear the voices of these young people that have given a gift to give us. So I'd like to turn this over to Madhumita Chakrabarti. It's all yours. Thank you, Greg, for that rousing ending, and thanks for your song, for your music. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us this evening. Today, we are hosting the third episode of the series, Voting Rights, The Struggle Continues. I'm honored to be part of this program today with all of you. I'll break it up into four pieces. I'll tell you a little bit about Living Legacy Project, a little bit of housekeeping with Zoom webinar, a reading, and then an introduction to our dear Reggie Harris. The Living Legacy Project organizes and leads civil rights pilgrimages to key sites in the American civil rights movement. Some of you have been on the bus with us, so you know we provide opportunities to meet and talk with veterans of the civil rights movement, to learn from them about the courage, resilience, and commitment the foot soldiers of the movement exhibited in the 1950s and 60s, and continue to do so to this day. The Voting Rights Act, passed in 1965, has been systematically dismantled. Today, it is only a shell of the original law. In the next few months, as we approach the 2020 presidential election, we can expect a significant increase in attempts to disenfranchise voters, especially voters of color, and especially because of the extraordinary circumstances presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. It is up to all of us to assure that every single person who is eligible and wants to vote can cast an uncontested ballot in this election. That's why the Living Legacy Project is offering this monthly online series called Voting Rights, The Struggle Continues. We're taking the opportunity to do what we couldn't do on a regular Living Legacy pilgrimage, which is to bring veterans of the movement, as well as the young activists that you'll meet today to each of you from the convenience of your homes all across the United States and further afield. We're so glad that each of you is here for the third of our six events. Now a few tips about using the Zoom webinar. To connect with other attendees, please use chat. You can turn on chat by clicking the chat button on your screen. If you want everyone to see your comments, choose all panelists and attendees from the drop down at the top of the chat panel. Please feel free to share resources and links related to voting rights in the chat. We'll share them with everyone by email after the program. And if you find chat to be distracting, feel free to turn it off. If you have a question for our panelists, please click the Q&A button on your screen and enter your question there. We'll be sharing your questions with the panelists toward the end of our conversation. Another thing, at the end of tonight's program, we will move to a Zoom meeting for an open discussion. The link to the Zoom meeting was sent to you when you registered in the original mail, as well as the reminder email you may have received today. This link will also be posted in the chat, and all you need to do is click on that link. Now for the reading. As we bid our goodbyes to John Lewis and think about his incredible courage in the midst of the struggle for civil rights and social justice, I recalled Romindranath Thakur, Tagore's prayer invocation during the Indian independence struggle to move from the British rule 
to manifesting a vision of a non-stratified non society living free from fear and ignorance. I will share that with you now. The poem source is the Gitanjali, and it was a poem number 35. Where the mind is without fear. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. Now, it's my great honor and privilege to introduce you to today's panel interviewer and program moderator, my friend and yours, Reggie Harris. Reggie is a current Woodrow Wilson scholar in the Independent College Lecture Program. He also serves as co-president and director of music for the Living Legacy Project, leads civil rights pilgrimages through the South and hosts seminars on voting and human rights to educate and inspire participation and reform. Reggie has garnered international acclaim as a singer, songwriter, storyteller, and cultural ambassador. He is recognized worldwide for his ability to inspire hope and create opportunities for building community and positive change. For 40 plus years, Reggie has been inspiring many, including me, since we first met at the Clearwater Festival in the 1980s. He embodies the spirit of his mentors and friends, Pete Seeger and Dr. Bernice Johnson Regan, as he blends themes of life and hope in his songs. While I could spend hours talking about Reggie, we are gathered this evening to explore voting rights. So please go to reggieharrismusic.com to learn more about all the many ways Reggie contributes to creating a more just society. Please give a warm welcome to Reggie Harris. Take it away, Reggie. Well, thank you, Madamita. And uh, thank you all to, who have gathered here tonight and joined us for this third edition of the Voting Rights of Struggle Continues. I'm in a little bit of a different role tonight. And I'd like to thank my friend Greg Greenway for singing so beautifully and for leading us in song. Uh, I promised Greg that I would not sing tonight. Um, the role is all his. Uh, I'm here tonight to moderate this uh, discussion, uh, largely because I've met all of these young people and I really have been so impressed by them, even the ones that I met only briefly uh, and I wanted to get, have an opportunity tonight to share them with you and to talk to them about voting rights and about the issues that are facing us. Uh, over the last three months, we have had an extraordinary experience of hearing panelists who have come to us, really amazing activists and amazing examples of leadership. And tonight, this will be no different. In order to honor the wide range of involvement in the civil rights movement and particularly around voting rights, uh, we asked these four young people to come tonight. And I say young people, it was interesting in our last panel uh, last month, uh, Arikia uh, Bennett, uh, one of our panelists said that she was really inspired when she looked around and saw the youth who were working and she is 26 years old. So, I will say that I am equally impressed by the four young people that we have with us tonight. And when I was reading their resumes and their accomplishments, I had to stop and wonder just for a moment what I was doing at their age. Well, we don't really need to go there. They have done some amazing things at their young ages. And I will not keep saying young because they are worldly wise in so many various ways. 
So Mata Mita has done a really wonderful job of, of uh, setting us up. And so I will remind you that if you have questions, that you put them in the Q&A. And we'll spend a few, time, a few minutes um, as we begin our discussion, I'll ask some questions and our guests will respond. I've told them that uh, I really would like them to, whenever they feel the need to, to respond to each other. So we will do that and we'll just feel this conversation out. They have many things to share. I will say, well, actually, I will keep my intros brief tonight because we don't have a lot of time. And so with that in mind, I'm going to introduce you now to our four guests, our four panelists for the evening. They are Latrice Johnson, Ahmad H. Jackson, Terriana Bailey, and Marquise S. Hunt. And I welcome you all and thank you so much for coming to share this time with us. I'm pleased to see each of them again. Uh, the three from Tougaloo actually came to speak to our students when we did a pilgrimage uh, this last January with Nazareth and Alvernia Colleges. And I will say at that time that they impressed not only our students, but all of our staff. It seems unbelievable that this was only in January, as we have experienced so much change in the world. So tonight we're going to talk about some of that change. And we're going to talk about what they are doing in their lives to effect a greater change in this larger landscape of opportunity. So let's start with Latrice Johnson. Latrice is a graduate, a 2020 graduate of Tougaloo College, which is located in Jackson, Mississippi. And first, Latrice, let me congratulate you on your accomplishment. She graduated with a degree in English and a minor in pre-law. And while at Tougaloo, Latrice served as a Vote for Everywhere ambassador and as a campus team leader for the Andrew Goodman uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, that organization honors the legacy of, of course, that civil rights pioneer and martyr. Latrice also worked with the civil rights veterans of Mississippi, and she worked in a host of other capacities as well. All this while getting her degree with honors. So thank you, Latrice, for joining us tonight. And I would like to ask you, what or who was the spark that lit your fuse and passion for voting and civil rights? Thank you, Mr. Harris. Um, so what actually inspired me? I've always been passionate about civil rights and all things black history. and. My decision to attend Tougaloo College in Mississippi was basically based on the history of the institution and it being known as the cradle of the civil rights movement. Um, and so the main person who really got me actively involved in both realms was Dr. Daphne Chamberlain, who was currently the assistant provost now. Um, she was my freshman year. She was my honors history professor. And we only met a few times for the class but in those few times, she brought in a local activist to register students to vote. And for me, coming from Oklahoma City, first year in college, that kind of amazed me to see that. I had never heard of people coming in registering students to vote on campus. I don't know that wasn't my mindset as a young, hopeful 18-year-old freshman on a college campus. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. So after that, she kind of saw how passionate I was about voting rights and civil rights and she kind of afforded me many opportunities after that i participated in a mini exchange program based on civil rights um, with brown university students and faculty thus that led to my um, volunteer work and intern work with the veterans of the mississippi civil rights movement um, which i've continued i continued for all four years while attending to glue so i kind of kept that relationship going um, and she, Dr. Daphne Chamberlain, again, recommended me for the Andrew Gibbon Foundation. And that's kind of what got me involved in voting rights. And I'm sure that she really saw how engaged I was on campus, even though she wasn't on campus. I was pretty active um, with the pre-law society. And with the 2016 election, we were on the roll getting things out. And um, I'm pretty sure she heard of me because I was so active. So that's kind of what got me actively involved. So your reputation reached her very quickly. Yes. Indeed. Wonderful. Well, 
Well, I, I believe that she may actually even be joining us tonight. So I'm <laughs> sure she's proud to see her <laughs> protege moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much for being here with us tonight. Uh, Ahmad H. Jackson, a 2019 graduate of Na Nazareth College in Rochester, New York. And uh, Ahmad graduated with a degree in legal studies and a minor in anthropology. And at Nazareth, uh, Ahmad worked with rebuilding projects in Nicaragua, traveled to concentration camps with Holocaust survivors, and he's presently now working towards his goal of one day becoming a judge. And I have no doubt that he's going to make it. Uh, Ahmad actually was one of the uh, members of the first delegation of Nazareth College that operated, uh, we have a co-sponsorship uh, co with Nazareth College and also now with Alvernia College. And Ahmad was one of our campus leaders who led that first trip. And my memory of Ahmad is that every day as I led the bus in singing and taught them the songs of the civil rights movement, at some point, Ahmad would come up to my seat and he would say, hey, Reggie, you got a minute? And I would say, yes. And he would play me some amazing video or some song of some conscious rapper that either tied into what I was talking about or expanded my knowledge a little bit of what is going on in the world. So Ahmad is still sending me those videos uh, as the weeks go on. So Ahmad, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And would you tell us what was your spark of inspiration? Thank you for having me. So um, I know that when I was really young, um, being from Harlem, that was my first experience of being aware of my existence and just the uh, different cultures that surround us in the community, especially like um, specifically with African-Americans but um, it expanded on Caribbean culture and just seeing the different varieties of what it meant to be black. And um, my father would always send me a book and he would tell me to, he would tell me to read it, make sure that um, I understand my history because even though I wasn't being exposed to it in school, that it was out there and it was my duty and my obligation to continue um, my education. Oh, marvelous. Well, thank you for your father. And thank you for, uh, you know, Harlem, USA. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask you um, later uh, to share a little bit about the pilgrimage that you went on, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah. Tariana Barely, a rising fourth year student at Tougaloo this year a biology and pre-med major. And you are currently the president of the NAACP chapter on campus, a former Global Leadership Academy researcher. And you've traveled to Seoul, South Korea to work with labor unions and social justice organizations and are presently working towards a career in music. So Teriana, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And who or what was your spark of passion? Thank you so much, Mr. Harris, and greetings to all. Um, just a little background, I will say, growing up in a single parent household um, in the small Mississippi Delta in Greenville, Mississippi, um, I grew up in a LSES, low socioeconomic status school where I was not exposed um, as a young child or even in high school about, you know, my surroundings, who I was, you know, racism and even the civil rights movement. But um, I say all of that to say once I um, attended Tougaloo College and became aware of all the rich history around me and becoming a part of these number of organizations like the NAACP um, and having people like Latrice mentioned, Dr. Chamberlain, Dr. Chamberlain see things in you that you probably don't even see in yourself. Um, it was people like that and joining organizations like that and being in an environment like Tougaloo College that really sparked my interest in the civil rights movement and voting. And I recently became the president of the NAACP, something that I never imagined. That's not something, you know, the 14 or 15 year old Tiriana would have imagined. But, um, and people like Arika, like you mentioned, who was on the previous call, I was um, an intern at her office with Mississippi Votes. 
And my freshman year, I got to travel to Seoul. And then my sophomore year, I got to travel to Accra, Ghana. So getting that exposure and um, really just going out on a leap of faith really sparked my interest in the civil rights um, you know, movement in history. Wonderful. Well, thank you. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. And last, but certainly not least, Marquise S. Hunt, also a senior at Tougaloo this year. And uh, Marquise actually has the distinction of being the very first first year student at Tougaloo to hold the position of president of the NAACP. Congratulations for that accomplishment. Uh, you're majoring in mass communications with a emphasis on public relations and journalism. Uh, Marquise also has worked with the I Am an Immigrant campaign to celebrate the contributions of immigrants. Uh, he has served with March on Mississippi, dealing with uh, uh, a, an organizing campaign at the Nissan plant in Canton, Mississippi, where they were using fear and intimidation uh, tactics. And also he worked to uh, address that issue with employers all across Mississippi. And I know from meeting Marquise in January that he enters a room and lights it up. So Marquise, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And what will you share with us about your spark of inspiration? Uh, first of all, I wanna say good evening and thank you for having me. Um, one of the things that sparked my, wouldn't necessarily say inspiration, but uh, a call to be duty bound to what is happening uh, in our country is in 2015, a young 18 year old uh, boy by the name of William Chapman II uh, was shopping in a local Walmart in my city. And of course we had just uh, before that had the killings of Eric Garner, uh, Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown. And the report ended up coming out on the news that William Chapman was shot and killed um, in the head and the, in the chest by a police officer for uh, reportedly still in the candy bar in our local Walmart. So of course we've heard that narrative so many times about uh, young black uh, people, men and women who are accused of stealing, but yet the items that they are accused of stealing are never to be found. Um, and so I found it possibility to be present uh, with the family of William Chapman and the organization of the NAACP that were doing work on the ground at that time um, to really be vocal, uh, but not only just protesting as, which is one of the things that we've been seeing a lot lately, but also connecting the dots between the protest and the advocacy piece and making sure that we were holding elected officials accountable, that we were making sure that people were out there and they were registered to vote and encouraging them to go to the polls because of course, uh, with the number of names that we can call about those who have been killed due to police violence, um, I think that it's our responsibility uh, with just that alone to make sure that we are showing up to the polls and exercising our right to vote. And so of course that led me to be able to be engaged in so many other projects, uh, which I'm blessed to have had the opportunity to do, um, but also recognizing that the work didn't stop in 2015 and it doesn't stop today. And so like uh, Latrice and Terriana said, having individuals like Dr. Chamberlain, who when you literally first step onto the campus, not knowing anyone, uh, recognizing, uh, I would say the gift that we all had when it came to leadership, but also making sure that uh, she recognized what impact we wanted to make on, on the world. And so uh, that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Well, that's a great nutshell. I want to follow that up. Um, you know, we have come a long way since January and the world has changed in so many ways, particularly our nation has changed. Uh, some of the things that you mentioned and the pandemic and, uh, and other issues, the pulling down of statues and symbols. I'm going to ask you what it is that you are seeing in this time. What has changed? What has changed about what you're doing? Or, or what do you feel a call to now, knowing that we are in this new landscape of, of possibility? Well, one, I'll say I'm optimistic about what uh, the future of our country will look like. Um, but two, one of the things that I have said before, and, I, and I've shared this with many other people, is that uh, as a black man in America, uh, I hate it here. And I hate it here because of the systematic legacy uh, that white people have somewhat uh, born and bred when it comes to oppression, systematic racism, and so many different other things that we are yet enduring. And so when we think about the contributions that John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Martin Luther King, Megger Evers, Fannie Lou Hammer, and so many 
uh, phenomenal regular day people uh, recognized what it was their responsibility to do to make sure that the next generation didn't have to deal with the issues of theirs. I think that one of the things that I'm sure all of us can agree on is that there has been a uh, unspoken and, and, un, and really uh, unspoken blueprint about what it is that we are supposed to be doing and that we follow. And so when we talk about the torch being passed to the next generation, I think those who have come before us have done a phenomenal job of doing that. But like you said, um, and have alluded to that times are changing. And so when you look at the issues about removing the statues and changing the names of um, uh, schools named after Confederate soldiers, when we think about the implications that these visual and um, you know, these visual representations have on communities, especially communities uh, that are, you know, filled with black and brown folks, it's important to make sure that we know that history. And I know I saw in the, in the chat earlier about making sure that folks are telling the truth in our history books. And we see that there has been a, of course, um, an effort to continue to make sure that the history and, and the truth of America is not really told um, in the education of America. And so one of those, uh, those um, stories that I can go back to is the story of Emmett Till, whose birthday uh, was just this past Saturday. He would have been 79, 79 years old if he uh, had not been killed and kidnapped from his uncle's home in Money, Mississippi. But to know that, you know, there are stories about, so many different stories about what happened to Emmett Till and then so many pieces that are being left out about what actually happened to Emmett Till. And it's not for, if it had not been for me attending to Luke and going to Mississippi and being able to meet family members of Emmett Till's who, who was still alive and hearing the stories of people who were there, then we kind of wouldn't know um, the truth. And so I think it's important for the older generation to make sure that they continue to tell the stories so that we can have an appreciation of the struggle because I think it'll be vain for us to believe that the struggle begins with us because we see some issues happening uh, in our time and fail to recognize that the struggle has been here and the contributions that many folks have done to try and, and rid it. Thank you, thank you. Latrice, could you follow that up? So yes, um, I agree with everything that Marquise has said and stated. And myself, thinking of what's going on with these modern day lynchings that we are seeing day to day, every day on social media, seeing them via video footage. Um, we have the proof now today in this current present time. Um, I'm trying to get myself out of becoming desensitized to these images and to remain active and keep paying attention and keep staying, keep in tune and engaged to what's going on. Because a lot of times um, we'll see things and it won't always be in Minneapolis. It won't always be in New York. It won't always be everywhere else. Sometimes it's right down the street from us. So it kind of hits home um, and, and that, aspect, I've begun to think and ask myself questions of how can I contribute? Why am I contribu contributing and who am I contributing to when I'm doing this work and when I continue to do, do this work and where I will be doing this work um, for human rights, voting rights, civil rights, all of the above. And those are just some questions that I've been asking myself and that's kind of been guiding how I continue. How do we progress? And I think that's something that's been, those are questions that other activists and young ad activists have been using to guide their work on the front lines. Thank you. Yeah, well, just not just young activists, let me tell you. I'm reevaluating all the time. Ahmad, uh, you know, we talk about images in history. Some of what you send me all the time are videos that are taking that on. Can you talk to about uh, some of those images that you've been sending or, uh, or just address the question in your perspective? Well, um, just to jump right in, uh, one of the last songs that I sent you was called How Many Times by an artist named Aaron Allen Kane. And it was just the repetitive uh, vocal expression of how many times we have to continue to see these images and experience these uh, traumatic ex events and that have all of this pain that like um, I believe Marquise and Latrice and Tariana touched on just the aspect of it. Eventually it's, you get tired of being here and experiencing these things. And just to know that your grandparents, your great grandparents also experienced these um, traumatic experiences with, against, with the law. 
with um, these institutions that are supposed to be here for us. And just to know that it's probably going to continue to happen. And the w only way to combat it is to vote, is to challenge it and to do what our grandparents did in another um, format. So with music, I believe that it's been a way for us to convey our experiences, to convey our trauma without breaking down. Mm. And just to see the beauty in all of the different genre, all of the different um, cultures and perspectives is something that's gonna stick with me forever. And that's how I use it as a tool to deal with everything. Thank you, thank you. Teriana, uh, what do you have to share with us? Just to follow up with what Ahmad said, like to know that these traumatic events um, are a cycle, like it's something that's continuing to happen and to know that it's something that has happened hundreds of years ago, it's just really sad. And um, with what Latrice said, like I really took as a young activist, like you said, it's affecting all activists. Um, as a young activist, you know, with the whole pandemic and everything that's happening in my personal life, you know, I really had to take a moment and just step back because the George Floyd incident, George Floyd incident was really, you know, took a toll on me and I just had to step back and, you know, take a moment for myself and I'm really big on mental health and like talking to my therapist and her recommending and suggesting that you pull away from social media, unplug and learning that the, the internet and the news is not to inform me. It's only to entertain. It's not putting the truth out there. And as activists, you know, try not to say, I give up, this is too much, but knowing when it's, you take a step back because we can't fight for someone else if we're not well. So I really think that, you know, like Amaz said, this is something that will stick with us for the rest of our lives. And to see this happen right before our eyes is really, really a lot. And I'm just so grateful to be in spaces like this to where we have the opportunity to talk about it, express how we feel. And like we say in the good old Delta, don't sugarcoat anything. Um, I think that, you know, this is amazing, so. Thank you. Yeah, so we're certainly not here to sugarcoat. Um, uh, I wanna ask you all, as young activists, um, and um, you know, as as one who came to this because of my experiences growing up, but also from traveling around and, and seeing uh, situations in the world, what situations do you find yourselves in, um, and, and what are the challenges that you're seeing in this time uh, that make it difficult for you to do what you feel you need to do? Uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, people who may be threatening you or or maybe sometimes older, more seasoned people who don't maybe uh, under, who misunderstand or mis uh, or underestimate you. Uh, Marquise, what do you what do you see as you work along with older people or as you encounter situations? Can you repeat the question one more time? I yeah, just I don't to... think I was very clear, was I? Uh, I'm going to ask you this. Are you feeling threatened by the work that you're doing right now? And a second part to that, do you feel that people are allowing you to show your true self as you work to, uh, to accomplish your goals? One of the things that I'll say is that I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for permission from anyone to do what I need to do um, and, and, and do what, exactly what it is that I know that I've been called to do, which is to help my people at the end of the day. Um, ultimately, that's what it is. And as broad of a statement as that might sound, there's so many different things that comes under that. And so uh, like Latrice, who has done so much around, uh, you know, voting rights or Teriana, who's done stuff around activism in the NAACP, uh, there's so many different intersections that we could be working in that deal with black and brown folks in America. And so uh, one of the things that I also have to remind the elders um, and those who come before us and have put and laid down the groundwork for us to kind of follow and continue to do this work is that they once were our age. And the reality of it is <laughs> any movement that you look at in this country and across the world, we're led by young people. Um, and so we often see how those same young people grew to continue to do other great things in their communities and make a mark on the nation and the world. But the reality of it is they had a responsibility to their own communities first 
And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, you know, we recognize and have, I wouldn't necessarily say uh, that we've always just been woke, but also being woke and conscious and recognizing what our responsibility is. Uh, because one of the things that I've said not too long ago is that you can be woke all day long, but if you're not conscious, then you're not able to really connect the dots about what's going on and nor are you able to be useful in helping the situations uh, that we're dealing with in our communities, whether that be around police brutality, whether that be around voting, whether that be around health care, whether that be around discrimination in the workplace, uh, the lack of resources to public education, the list goes on and on and on. And I think we all find ourselves at the crossroads of trying to make sure that we're not only helping other folks who don't necessarily have to deal with these issues each and every day, making sure that there are resources and tools for people to kind of tap into so that we can continue to do this work and make sure that our communities have exactly what it is that they need. Tariana, you are coming up on a year of as president of the NAACP. What are you looking at? So honestly, I must say, um, with everything that's going on with my school and not knowing like what's next and I'm still working with the students. A student just reached out to me yesterday. She sent me, I mean, a list of things that the students could be doing to get engaged. So it really makes my soul happy, my heart smile. When I see that the students have not given up, you know, we've done Zoom calls, we've reached out, we've put resources out there, you know, check in on the group me every now and then and be like, hey, are you okay? Do you need this or do you need that? Um, but I'm really excited. It's been a year since I've been the president I'm going, like you said, I'm going into my last year, but I still continue, I still want to continue to work with the NAACP um, at my school and um, on the state level. So we'll see what we have. I mean, we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot to be done. There's never not enough to be done. And another important thing that, <clears throat> that I express to the students is there's enough room for everybody. There's a place for everybody, um, no matter your major, your race, or anything. There's so much work to be done, and there's a place for everybody, and there's a place for everyone to work. So mm -hmm. I'm truly, truly excited, you know, to be, to get back in the groove of, you know, working. Well, there certainly is a lot to be done. And uh, Latrice, do uh, you, you have any um, graduate wisdom? Been there, done that? <laughs> yes, actually, um, so just to piggyback off of what both of them said um, as far as challenges i've experienced those challenges before i even started a petition against the school my freshman year um <laughs> i came in on fire <laughs> but to that point like marquis said i've never i'm not one of those type of people that just like oh they told me i can't do it no i'm going to keep going after it i'm going to find a way there's some way that we can get our yes we can get our change we can get our amendment our alteration some type of way um and I think that's part of it is just having a mindset of having that optimism, that hope, and knowing that you can achieve, you can get whatever you are striving to work and get for your peers. Um, and also, as far as just the older generation, I think I haven't experienced uh, too many people, too many older um, activists that have really kind of persuaded me against or dissuaded me um, from the work. If anything, they've said the same things Marquise said, that they were once those us, they were once us out there on the front, on the front lines. And so they've always provided that good advice, those tips um, on how to maneuver, how to do this, how to strategize and organize. And those are the key things in activism. And I think that's been the most helpful because usually you'll hear people say, oh, the older generation doesn't listen and stuff like that and that's true for the most part but usually <laughs> usually they'll um offer something there is some benefit in exchanging ideas and thought processes and thinking with uh between and amongst generations oh my my i think we've been outed here i think uh <laughs> we we uh, the older generation us seasoned folks aren't listening enough to y'all <laughs> well, I'm going to listen up to that. Ahmad, uh, you're back in the world and you're uh, working down in New York, the New York area and uh, working on your goals. What, what are you seeing as challenges and uh, your interactions with folks? So one thing that I've noticed is that often people that are oppressed, all groups, they tend to, as a defense mechanism, point their hatred or anger towards other groups that are also oppressed 
in an attempt to make themselves feel better, to not feel like they're the worst. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that with uh, men, especially men of color, we tend to forget the intersectionality point and how women and LGBTQ plus groups and also other groups that are not uh, African-American groups are impacted by oppression as well. So I find it that I'm often having to check my colleagues and something that they said that was homophobic or something that they said is offensive towards women. And I think that it's imperative to continue to, to check and hold each other accountable. Uh -huh. And it's, it's very frustrating because you can clearly see that you've experienced the same thing. So why are you perpetuating what you're condemning? And so as I grow older, I'm trying to make sure that I'm paying attention to the, the new perspectives that are coming from the younger generations and just being aware and open to changing dialogue and accepting what's acceptable and not acceptable and tone and language that's not acceptable anymore. And I think that it's important for older generations as well to hop on the train. Indeed it is, indeed it is, right? We are, um, we are always having to check ourselves and check uh, where we are in the process. And uh, you know, folks are writing in and our time is going quickly. So I'm gonna jump over to our Q&A and um, I'm gonna open up this up. Um, if you hear the question and you have uh, something you'd like to share, I'm just gonna offer the questions out. Uh, from Kim Estelle, I'm very disheartened, though sadly not surprised by the egregious attempts to disenfranchise voters. What concrete, concrete acts can we do to reduce this interference? One of you speak to that, please. One thing I will say um, with all the voter suppression and all that's going on around voting and in, um, voting coming up so soon, don't give up. Going and making sure you're taking the necessary steps and actions that are needed so that mm -hmm. your vote counts. And it's important to let people know that their vote matters. You know, and it was really shocking to me to hear people say, oh, my vote doesn't matter or this is this. I do want to say and I'm going to always say no matter what discussion I get on, you know, don't give up. Your vote does matter and reach out to somebody. There are so many resources out there that can help you um, in understanding what you need to do, what steps do you need to take so that you are voting. And just like with the whole, I just saw on social media earlier today about voting ahead of time so that your vote reaches, you know, wherever it needs to be, like mailing your vote in a week or so ahead of time or two weeks ahead of time so that your vote counts. And some people precincts not opening due to the pandemic and so much going on to try to stop us from voting. But I feel like don't use that as a reason or excuse not to vote, but as um, fire to, you know, go out and vote. So that's what I want to speak on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, want to chime in on that? I know one of the things that we have to get used to as, as activists and as woke people is that we're not going to always get what we are desiring to get first time out, second time out, third time out. We've been at this for about 379 years. So. Uh, what challenges do you see, this is from Christine Hager, what challenges do you see for voting rights in states affected by the Supreme Court decision? Or what challenges are, are happening around, uh, around where you are right now? Marquise, what's happening? Sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the things that I think uh, is important to know, like Terriana just mentioned, is that voter suppression is very real and is very real amongst black and brown communities and looks so different. We saw voter suppression very real in the state of Georgia when Stacey Abrams was running for governor. And you saw in communities where there were enough um, voting machines, but only one outlet for the voting machine to be plugged up to. We saw voter suppression in Mississippi when Mike Espy was running against Cindy Hyatt Smith. Um, and you saw communities across the state where they would go to the polls, there were supposed to be two names on the ballot, and yet there was only one name listed. 
And so when you look at these type of trends that happen in communities where uh, all of us have access to the data that shows that if you have a certain percentage of uh, this demographic of voters who show up to the polls, then the likelihood of you winning is X, Y, and Z. And so in order for them to eliminate and make sure that the barrier is still standing, they work effortlessly and tirelessly to make sure that the, the levels of systematic oppression continue to raise and that it looks differently. And so sometimes we might come, uh, to, and, and I'm not, you know, I know that it'll happen this November, which is unfortunate, is that there's going to be something different um, when it looks, when it comes to voter suppression. And we've already seen the United States Postal Service talk about making sure that you are mailing your ballots back in at least 14 days before the election because they won't get back in and they won't get counted. And so I think we have to make sure that not only are we recognizing what the suppression and the oppression looks like in our communities when it comes to uh, following the, the governmental system uh, that has been given to us to somewhat voice our opinions and also recognizing that our voices are being uh, silenced. But at the same time, making sure that we're holding our elected officials accountable who have voted uh, to make sure that the certain institutions and to make sure that the certain, uh, you know, that they're giving these uh, contracts to certain businesses and companies to carry out these uh, responsibilities like transporting the, 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 the ballots to one place to another and then the ballots not being counted, they're going missing in travel. So there's so many different things that we've got to look at. Thank you. Latrice, you want to follow in? Yes. So, uh, sorry, I broke in for a minute. No, no, no. He was, he was uh, frozen. So you can okay. keep right there. <laughs> so I was speaking on the issues of um, college campuses that have polling places. Um, that's something that may be an issue coming into election season. So for those colleges that aren't returning to campus, what will the students do? Um, how will that work out for them? And that's uh, a question for the campus leaders, the young people, the students, to connect with administration, their administration, um, as far as that goes, and to make sure that the word is getting out to the students via uh, institution website or social media platforms that campus leaders have or campus organizations. And I think that's also something that we, um, as people, should consider for those college students like me, um, who aren't from their, from the states that they're attending school. So if I'm not from here, and we're not coming back to school, then what do I do? How how much time do I have left to re-register at home, or how much time do I have left to send in my ballot? Um, and that's just something else to consider. More ways to discount votes. Uh uh, Jane Park is writing with a, uh, a question for uh, Ahmad Jackson. Uh, hello from Florida. Uh, would Ahmad, uh, would Mr. Jackson be willing to share a short list of favorite songs sometimes? And uh, thanks to this great panel uh, for all of you for making time to share your time with us. Ahmad, would you be willing to share some of those songs? Maybe become a playlist? Yes, yes I'll make one. Okay, uh, we can probably make that happen if um, you either send them to me or we can actually, uh, we'll add them in on the, uh, the follow up uh, to this uh, series. Um, so okay. if, you'll be our, if you'll be our playmaster, we'll send it out to the people. Uh, from Phyllis Lerner, uh, I'd like to know if and why, why kids don't register to vote in schools and communities. Are you having that problem on your college campuses? Tariana? Most definitely. I mean, who isn't, honestly, at this point? But I want um, a few things, like there's been a lot of confusion with like students being from out of state. So say you have a student, you have students at Tougaloo from Chicago or students from Minneapolis or students from Virginia and they're at school and during um, election time, they're in the state of Mississippi and they're on Tougaloo's campus. And so getting those students to register you know, in the county that they'll be in, it's been quite difficult. And like Latrice said, a big issue is going to be students won't be returning in the fall. They'll be online and some students will be home in different states. So for those students who did change their address over, I mean, how do we go from there? So there's been a lot of issues. Um, a lot of students um, feel that their vote doesn't count. I've heard that their vote doesn't count. Um, I've heard students say it's too complicated. I don't have time. Um, some students just aren't aware. You will be surprised how many students, how many freshmen come on campus and aren't registered to vote or who are not aware of the importance of voting. So it may not be until their junior or senior year where we can get a hold to them and really 
you know, explain and instill to them the importance of voting. So those are just the few issues that I have personally encountered, you know, trying to get students to register um, on campus. Wow. Uh, our time is going away and we're in the lightning round now. So a question from Susan Eichel. My question for these inspiring activists, when you encounter white people who ask, what can I do? What do you tell them? Who's up? Okay, I guess I'll be up because I'm going <laughs> to do a whole lot. Um, one of the things that's really important is to make sure that you're having serious conversations with your family and friends. Uh, one of the things that I think a lot of times happens is that when there are certain white people who know what the issues are um, that black people are facing, that they often are smiling in black folks' faces when it comes to agreeing with what the issues are and trying to make it seem as if that they're you know, understanding and empathetic and sympathizing to what black communities have faced, but yet when they turn their backs, uh, the conversations that they're having amongst their friends and folks who look just like them are not identical. And so I think it's important to make sure that the conversations um, are consistent. But then too, it's important to make sure that resources are being given to amplify the voices of young uh, black and brown activists and organizations who are doing work on the ground, because a lot of the times you'll find folks who just don't want to go outside and protest. They don't want to, you know, be on the front lines, as we call it. They don't want to, you know, uh, get on a Zoom call. And so they try and figure out what other ways that they can be involved. And the reality of it is a lot of folks have to have financial resources in order for the movement to keep on moving. Um, and we've seen that with organizations that we've been a part of, or whether that's a small donation of five or $10 to large donations over a thousand to where those funds are being used to help continue the movement because young people um, are getting burnt out and a lot of the times they're not being paid for the work that they're doing and I'm not saying that we necessarily are looking to get paid but there are content and there are stories that are being told um, and by black and brown people and other institutions are stealing the information that they're uh, putting out and using it for their own profit and so if that's going to be the case you might as well go ahead and pay us for what we what we didn't set up here and talk about Anybody else want to tag in before we close off our, our audience well, questions? Go. One thing I realized is that, um, so there's a big saying that with the MTA, when you see something, say, say something. And a lot of times um, I feel like white people are more in the position to um, take an authoritative role in a situation and, without there being repercussions. So for example, I was in um, a store and I attempted to return a shirt and they wouldn't allow me to return it even though I had the receipt and everything in the bag. So one of my um, close friends, his mother came downstairs and she was able to return it. And she immediately asked to talk to management and address the situation. And so uh -huh. with a more um, concrete example, I would say when you see uh, people of color being followed around in stores, speak up for them. When you see children being, um, followed by the police and they are clearly not doing anything wrong, speak up. And um, recognizing your position of, of power and your position to make it, make change and addressing that change, not only in the moment, but um, going forward. You know, we could take this to nine o'clock and we would be here sharing some amazing stuff. Unfortunately, we only have an hour uh, we'd like to honor people's uh, uh, time and, and commitment to that hour. And we on, honor also your time and commitment for showing up tonight and, and bringing the goods. Um, you all inspire me in such amazing ways. Your thoughtfulness, your articulation, but also with the fact that you are getting your hands dirty and you're getting it done. Uh, so thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. I am inviting you into the chat room uh, after uh, the program. We'll have some folks who will come in. They'll want to engage you a little further. Um, so as you are able, please join us there. Uh, for those of you in our audience, um, the chat um, uh, link is in the email that you got, and it's also listed in the, uh, the chat here tonight. Um, just as a final thought, I want to say that as our panelists have said tonight, there is much work to be done, and it's important so important that we not try to do the perfect thing that is going to solve all these problems. We are not going to fix racism 
homophobia and all that. We are not going to fix all of the in, injustices that are happening in the voting issues around the country. However, whatever we do fix, we can push forward. So that's our mission. Do something and let's do it together. Uh, I do want to, before we close out, and we're going to close with uh, Greg Greenway leading us out in song. Thank you again, Greg. Thank you to our panelists for coming and, uh, and the marvelous examples that you are of leadership in our country. Uh, we're going to ask you all to remember to join us on August the 26th. It will be our fourth voting rights series program. Uh, it will be National Women's Equality Day. And our special guests for that broadcast will be Michelle Duster, author, speaker, and educator. She is the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells Barnett, the iconic anti-lynching activist and suffragist. We will also have Shavara Oren, author and diversity and inclusion practitioner. And she is the daughter of civil rights leader, Reverend James Bevel. And we also will be joined with the Honorable Andrea Jenk Jenkins, author, poet, and community leader. And she is the vice president of the Minneapolis City Council and the first openly trans woman elected to public office in that state. So thank you again for joining us for this time. Uh, I am going out of here inspired and we've got a great song to close out. So Greg Greenway, lead us on. In August of 1963, John Lewis was 23 years old when he stood on that, that stage in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And when I, when I see you, Latrice, Ahmad, Terriana, and Marquise, I know where we're going to find our next John Lewis and our next Diane Nash. So here's a song from Little Troy, New York, to that stage, to his office in the Capitol building. John Lewis could have said to himself, it's a mighty long way from there to here. It's a mighty long way from where we want to be. Ooh, it's a mighty long way ooh, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way ooh, from there to here. We're going to take it, oh yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here. Here's that works. It's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from there to here, there to here. We're going to take it, oh yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here what can a man see outside his window it's a whole lifetime from there to here and all those people who gave their sweat and their blood so that he could make that walk from there to here. Oh, it's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from there to here. We're gonna take it, oh yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here. Now every child born is a revolution, is a revolution with a song inside. Some won't hear it, oh, some hear nothing else. He'll sing night and day just to keep that song alive. Oh, it's a mighty long way, it's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way. Ooh, from there to here We're gonna take it Oh yes, one step at a time So that we can make that walk from there to here Now when you've got a dream you got to stand up, stand up and shout it, shout it loud and clear. What's that I'm hearing? It's the voice of the young people singing that we will make that walk from there to here. 
here. Oh, it's a mighty long way. It's a mighty long way from over yonder, from over yonder. It's a mighty long way. It's a mighty long way from there to here. We're going to take it. Oh, yes, one step at a time so that we can make that walk from there to here. So that we can make that walk from there to here. So that we can make that walk from there to here.